Welcome, folks. Welcome to another episode of our live session here. It can be quite difficult for business analysts to find the path forward in their careers once they reach a certain level of seniority. Because traditionally, um, the path forward for a lot of business analysts has seemed like they have to either detour into project management, to get into management and pursue leadership positions inside of companies. But there are a lot of other options that are avail to, uh, available to business analysts out there. And today's guest um, is going to be helping us to explore some of those other options by examining really kind of the process that they've gone through in their own um, very lengthy career as business analysts. And they've made certain decisions uh, in their careers that have led them to where they are today. And so we're gonna be exploring all of that in the conversation today with our guest. Now, um, before we get into that, for those of you who are new, uh, my name is Imal Berrielli. I've been a business analyst since 2005. And before that, I have spent my entire educational life getting formally trained as a business analyst. And so you can find out a little bit more about me at bablocks.com slash about. Um, as always, I want to um, share with you the uh, website that we have set up for you to find access to all of the links that we share um, in is in this live session here. So one of the very first links that you're going to see here is the link to Jamie's LinkedIn profile. And once you visit his profile, you can go down to the experience section here and just scroll all the way down to the bottom to find out that Jamie started his career as a business analyst, as a junior business analyst in 2005. And outside of a small seven month detour here, he has been involved in project execution work since 2005. And he has eventually ended up in the position where he is at now today. And so what we're gonna do in this conversation is um, we're gonna walk through really a lot of the decisions that Jamie has made uh, throughout his career and to start to get an understanding of maybe some of the thought process, some of the decisions that he was up against and why he decided certain things over other things. As always, we are live right now. And so please let me know where you're tuning in from in the comments and we'll, we'll, we'll continue to go through those comments as we're conducting the live session. More importantly, I would say that if you have any questions um, about career development and about some of the decisions that you may be up against in your own career, feel free to drop those in the chat and Jamie and I can both speak to those as we're going through. Without further ado, um, I would like to welcome Jamie Toyin to uh, our conversation. Welcome Jamie um, to the show. Hi, Amal. Hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, depending where you are. Jamie, I want to first of all appreciate you for taking the time to join us. Um, I know that given your current position, you have way more uh, <laughs> things that are would normally be on your plate um, if you weren't in the position that you are. So I really do appreciate you taking the time to come out. Um, Let's take a look at some of the comments here because it seems like we have a lot of folks coming uh, in from across the pond here. We have Samson coming in from uh, Birmingham, the United States, and for across the pond for me, I'm in Canada, so across the pond for me is where you're at, JB. We have uh, we have Sinead coming in from Northwest England. Uh, we have Coyote uh, coming in from 
I'm hoping I'm pronouncing this right, but Convey Island, Essex, UK. So a lot of folks uh, from your side of the pond that are tuning in today. Welcome, folks. Jamie, um, we had a quick um, look at your LinkedIn profile. I'm wondering if you can just kind of give us a quick overview of how you would kind of describe your overall career trajectory since you started in 2005. Yeah, sure. Um, well, firstly, thank, thanks for inviting me along today, Mal. It's great to be here and always a big fan of the BA Blocks um, webinars and things you do. So really excited to be here. Um, with regards to my career, I mean, I'd love to say I, I plan to be a business analyst. I, I'd be lying if I said I did. Um, so like many, I had other other things that I thought about doing. Up until the age of about 14, I wanted to be a vet. Um, so I wanted to be a you know a veterinary doctor. Um, and I realized, A, that was a lot of work. Um, B, uh, my grades probably weren't good enough in biology and, and, uh, and chemistry. Um, and I thought, okay, may, maybe maybe veterinary through other veterinary science isn't for me. Um, and I've always been interested in business. So even from a young age, I was helping neighbors design websites and helping them to design logos and one of my neighbors um who really um you know who really helped i guess build some of my confidence on this one of those things i was helping him um produce brochures and literature on septic tanks of all things you know the world of septic tanks at, wow. uh, at, yeah. at 14 15 probably wasn't a world i want to go back into but it was an interesting space all the time all the, all the same um but after that i actually decided not to go to university i'm probably one of the few, I would argue, in, in business analysis that didn't go to university. So I, I, I completed what we call in the UK in my A-levels and um, and then I decided not to. I, I, I was probably liking partying too much at the time, as my parents would say. And I thought, well, surely that's university is a great reason to go. I can carry on partying for more years. That's right. Um, but I decided against it and I had a free thing of well, what's the best thing for me going forward. So um, I actually went to work in a call centre and I was doing that alongside studying. And like talking to people, sort of lots of problems. It was in the world of automotive glazing, so windscreens, or I think windshields, as maybe they're called in, in North America. Mm -hmm. And and um, and yeah, I, I fell into this, getting seconded into this huge program to to, to replace pretty much all their systems um, into one. And um, initially, that was more in the sense of helping to develop some processes and then start to train some of those processes out. So I was training people in the call center through to then going around the country, training people who are brilliant with cars, how to use a system and explaining the mechanics of a system when they were used to using paper and older systems before. And that's how I really got into business analysis. So it was, it was by accident, being really honest. Yeah, and I think that that is so common because out of all of the interviews that I've done of the senior folks, aside from myself, I haven't met a single person who formally trained <laughs> to become an analyst so i think i'm a bit of the uh a bit of the odd man out in in that i've i've kind of gone through that process but uh, i think it's very common for most business analysts even now uh, throughout my practice i see a lot of analysts who are really just kind of finding themselves in that position being seconded in for a project and eventually just liking it so much and and moving forward with it so um so that's where you started off as a junior business analyst. And fun fact, folks, Jamie and I both started our careers in 2005, the same year. And so I think we have that one thing in common. Since starting out on that career, I think you've served as a project manager, business analyst combo. You've served as a project manager, kind of standalone position. You've done a lot of business analysis work and you've kind of progressed from an analyst to a senior analyst. And I think that there's a certain point in your career where you took the leap from a senior analyst into a managerial position, a manager of business analysis position. Can you help us to understand what, what kind of brought about that, that shift in your career? Yeah, sure. Um, I think it's a tough one, isn't it? Because when you love something you do, often they say the worst thing you can do is go and climb a management ladder within it. Because um, right. often you get so far away from the thing that you love doing. And I think that's true in any profession, you know, whether that be business analysis or anything else. And so it wasn't an easy decision. Um, if I'm honest, that was probably the hardest decision 
or one of the hardest decisions in my career. We'll come on to another one of more recent um, later on. Um, but yeah, it was one of the hardest decisions I had in my career and, 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 for, and mainly for that reason. But also, secondly, I think like many analysts, you know, I'm, I'm a relatively confident guy, but like, you know, like most people are confident, you can still suffer from things like imposter syndrome. And I thought, am I good enough? I've not, you know, some people have been business analysts for 30 years and they're, they're, they, they don't want to climb the ladder and, and, and take on managerial roles. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, so it required a lot of thought. Um, but I think probably for me, what, what really attracted me to it was was two things. One, I've always been passionate about what I do in, in, in the world of business now. It's, it's something that I love doing. It's something that I enjoy doing. It's something that I've even gone on to set my own business up that only specialised in business analysis for that reason. So I never wanted to, to leave it. Um, but at the same time, I didn't want to progress and go down the path of progression that was looking at um, project management or, or product management. I wanted to stay within the profession. So it was weighing up both of those. And it was also weighing up something that I also really enjoy, which is nurturing others, helping others progress, and particularly, you know, more junior talent coming into profession into the profession. And I think that's probably because I was looked after quite early on and um and I probably didn't have a path where I was, knew where I was going necessarily. At one point I did, then went into a party phase, then sort of fell into things and fell into business analysis. I, I felt there was a bit of a I guess uh, a, a debt to repay, if, if I'm being really honest. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, getting quite deep now on a, on a on a Monday, a Tuesday afternoon. Sorry, Tuesday morning. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, I, I I think you are, but I think that that's so. Folks who get into management for that purpose tend to be make some of the best managers because it seems like there are. I mean, there are different flavors of managers. And some are just super results oriented, don't provide a lot of support to their employees and just expect output. But I think that for an analyst to be able to truly grow within their career, it's difficult to do that unless you're reporting into a person who I think has kind of been through it themselves and understands the difficulties and really can kind of... um, Help to kind of guide a person through through that. So, I mean, having that as your motivation, I think is, um, I think it's a noble one. But I think not only that, but I think it's, um, it sets you up to actually be able to excel in that type of a role properly. And I'm not sharing uh, my screen, but I am going through your LinkedIn profile as we're going through here because I see that um, a short while after you became a business analyst manager you really kind of, um, your career really kind of accelerated quite quickly after that, where you became the head of business analysis uh, for uh, a much larger organization. Um, And eventually you've now ended up with where you're at today. And so maybe you can kind of give us a quick, um, quick idea of where you're at today and how you actually got to where you're at. Yeah, sure. well, um, where I'm at now is I've recently set up my own business. So um, I guess not only did we start in the same year um, going into the world of business analysis, Imar, we're actually are both entrepreneurs, I guess. We've both got our own businesses that are very much in the world of business analysis, which in itself is uh, can be an interesting space to be in. And I guess we can probably explore that more in a moment. But um, with, with regards to how did I get there, um, I... Um, so the last two organizations I worked in before setting up my own organization, Herd Consulting, were actually in central government, so in the, in the British central government. Um, and one was in what's called DBP, the Department of Work and Pensions, um, and that's around welfare payments, retirement, um, supporting those in vulnerable positions to get back into work or um, helping them um, with, with, you know, with living costs in, in, in you know, vulnerable positions in their life. Um, and then I also went on to, as, as a consultant, head of BA to the Ministry of Justice, which probably is a bit more Ron Seal in the name around justice, prisons, uh, probation service, helping people who are victims of crime um, and, and the such like. Um, and both of those, I guess, never, if I'm being really frank, I never actually wanted to work as a civil servant, as we call it in the UK. I never wanted to work um, within, within the government. It was never a particular calling. Um, and I actually had a call one day out of the blue whilst I was working for a, a telco provider. 
and so there's this great world come up would he be interested in it? it was a deputy head of role it was helping to shape this large practice i think at the time it had 130 or so analysts so it was a particular large practice spread over the whole of the country um and if honest the organization itself probably didn't attract me but the role just sounded so exciting mm -hmm. a for the you know the scale it was at b because it was really um, leading the way in investing in developing the next generation uh, of analysts and still does today um you know in terms of an in-house program that they offer and, and also being on external providers too um so i joined there and it was a role that really attracted me more than the organization and i guess then being in that organization there was two things there's, there's one you've got really passionate people about what they do in terms of business analysis um and there's a really good community that carried on evolving and maturing but it was even good um, you know when i first joined it was really you know engaged and and proud community if I'm honest proud to be a business analyst which I thought was a really a really great thing to see it's not something you always see you know people don't always come across as being proud in what they do mm -hmm. um so so that was that was a big that was a big attraction but actually then I fell in love with the world of actually serving others and helping others um in an indirect way you know it's, it's different it was a different different challenge if I'm honest and a, a different a different part of my brain which I pulled on you're not trying to help an organization maximize their, their net ads you're not trying to help them maximize uh, their bottom line you're actually trying to help the most vulnerable in society so um but yeah i i, I went in when it was in that world for five or so years really really enjoyed it in both ddp and in moj um led 300 analysts um in ddp when we got to the peak um, i think that's even bigger now and then went into a to, to mature an existing practice in the Ministry of Justice, which uh, much smaller, much more focused. To honest, in some ways, I preferred that in a way because you can actually get to know everyone's name and remember them with yeah. 300 people, if I'm, if I'm honest, it was really tough, particularly in person. Um, and yeah, after that, I decided um, that uh, for some reason, you know, it was the best time in my life to establish a business. And I say that tongue in cheek, um, I just had our first child, um, our little boy, um we just moved house um congratulations we, yeah yeah so lots of big things are happening and then for some reason i decided yeah what a great time to set a business up so <laughs> I, I mean there you are i'm not saying i'm the best yet we didn't make the best informed decision there but yeah. i thought let's do this it's something i've always wanted to do and and i guess why did i do that well the timing we can talk about another time but um I, I can't give you a really good answer on that but with regards to why did i do it full stop it was um a few reasons really one um you know you, you can only get so much um you can have so much influence in the culture i think um working in somewhere um you know even as a ceo of an already established organization you can only have so much influence in the culture right. um so for me that was that was one part um you know it was something i wanted to set up my own organization with its own culture own brand own identity and in my i know you're one of your other loves outside of business analysis is branding as well, uh, as you told me the other day. Um, so I guess maybe not quite the same level, but there's an interest there too. Um, but the other two things was yeah. I, I wanted I wanted to re I wanted to reinvent business analysis a little bit. Uh, I wanted to get that 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 rock star vibe back into the profession, and um, hence why we've trailblazed that that term rock star business analysis um, for a little bit over the last few months and. Um, and that was that was the main thing. And and then the, there is one more, and I'll shut up. I promise. Um, which is around. Um, I think I'd, I've worked with so many consultancies over the years. I'm sure we all have. Um, mm -hmm. Some brilliant. Um, some maybe brilliant in certain areas, but not brilliant in every area. And I think it's quite tough as a consultancy to offer everything to everybody because it's very difficult to be everything to everybody. You can't you can't really do that very easily. Mm -hmm. You know, regardless of scale. And, and for me, I saw a real gap in in that sort of area of, you know, a, a truly specialist business analysis consultancy where people were really excited and energized to be analysts and 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 the power that can have on 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 their organizations and, and the, the client organizations they work with. So that's quite a big answer. Um, I'll but yeah. I, yeah, no, I mean, look, I think it's a it's a powerful thing when you can really kind of just leverage everything that you've built up over your career and use that to kind of propel yourself into a position where you're getting a lot more meaning out of what it is that you're doing. And I think that the way you describe this, I, I think kind of exemplifies that 
perfectly because in my own career, um, I describe it more as boredom because I tend to get a little bit bored when I've done the same thing too many times. And I'm constantly looking for, you know, what can I learn? Where's the next big challenge that's happening? But I've constantly had this same impulse in uh, over my career where I get into a situation and I learn as much as I possibly can. And I, and I eventually reach a point where I think to myself, where do I see myself doing this for the rest of my life? And the answer inevitably comes back as no. And when I start to search, um, when I start to search for my next steps in my own career, um, even myself thinking back to you know the 2008, 2009, 2010, even to me, um, it seemed like project management was kind of the next step, was the only next step, it, unless you wanted to become a manager. Um, it's I think it's very inspiring to see somebody who has actually kind of taken that step and really just kind of blasted right through. And now you're in a position where you're actively really kind of just kind of filling a gap in the profession and trying to shape the profession um, instead of just operating within it. And I think that that's a really powerful position to be in. If you don't mind, I'm just going to share my screen a little bit here again, just to kind of show folks the um, for, for those folks who um, have never seen the website, bablocks.com slash live, you can get the link or you can just go directly to herd.consulting and you'll get a much clearer picture of um, what Jamie and his team uh, have been up to, up to because um, part of the reason why I wanted to have Jamie on, on the show is because... I think that there is a lot of room in our profession to do things significantly differently than the way they may have been done. And I think it is through initiatives like this where you're likely to see the most innovation in business analysis. And when you have somebody who is as experienced and as talented as Jamie leading an initiative like this, it's important to keep an eye on, on organizations like this because this is where a lot of innovation tends to come from. So if you go to herd.consulting, you'll you'll get a much better idea of who's on the team and what kind of things they've been up to. Um, the thing that really kind of jumped out at me, if I had to really kind of summarize your career trajectory as a business analyst, I'd say, okay, so you started off as a junior BA, you fell into it accidentally, which is, I think, where how most people fall into it. And you really just kind of grabbed the bull by the horns and really kind of steered things in the direction that you wanted them to go. Because after a certain number of years, you did a little bit of exploration in your career. I mean, you went into doing a little bit of portfolio management in your career, which is outside of business analysis. But then you came in and you did some project management and then you did a lot more business analysis. So it seems like you did a little bit of career exploration. You like business analysis. You came back to it. And, if, and feel free to correct me if, if you feel like I'm mischaracterizing anything here. Um, you like business analysis and you found an opportunity to get into management, which felt like the right fit for you. Now, I'll, I'll stop right there because I've hit that point in my career myself and I've taken a bit of a different direction. Now, there are... Um, there's a point in my career where uh, project management was made available to me and um, a manager position was, uh, it was made clear to me that, that that that's the direction that my company wanted me to go in. And it's something that I kind of instinctively shied away from. And when I reflect back on my career and why it is that I did that, I always find that um, it was because of the fact that I didn't want to get too far away from the weeds. And so I'm really kind of the type of person who likes to roll my sleeves up and get into the details. And I felt like getting into management would take me farther away from that. And I think I had to make a bit of a sacrifice at that point, just in terms of income and in terms of really kind of career progression to kind of stick with what it is that I wanted to do. That put me in a bit of a position where I thought, well, I could be I could be making a lot more income as a manager than as an analyst. 
how do I make up for that difference, right? And my rationale for getting into consulting was to really try to harvest that difference between the value I was providing and the compensation I was making as a permanent employee. And so getting into consulting was my way of saying, look, I know that I don't want to be a manager, but I do like the income. So consulting for me was really that path forward. And it's a path that's worked out quite well. Would you, um, did you ever wrestle with any of those types of questions? I mean, I know you've chosen the management path, so maybe not, but was that ever, those types of thoughts ever swim around in your mind during your decision-making? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, of course they, they did. And, and I think, you know, most people, you know, if they're really honest, you know, when they really look at what, what drives them in terms of what they enjoy, that's always probably going to be the, 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 a dominant factor, if not the main dominant factor. But of course, your lifestyle and the needs of that lifestyle are also an important part, if not, you know, equally as important in terms of what you do. So I think people often shy away from that. And I think firstly, thank you for, for being so brave to share, to share your thought process there. And, and but yeah, you, you're right, it, it was. And leadership positions tend to pay more than non-leadership positions i mean that's i think true the world over right. um so of, of course that was an appeal um i think there's also there's also a view of actually where there's th th a tricky point as well i think when you get into a leadership position within a profession you can only get so far mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you have to then think where do i want to go next Right. It's also, if you're not careful, if you have too much time off the tools, it can be then difficult to get back into things. So I, I, I guess the thing that I've been quite conscious of and particularly uh, heard and particularly prior to heard was to keep my hands in still on some of the tools and still involved in certain things and still in, using some of that strategic analysis mindset uh, on stuff. Because it can be very easy to fall into a path of being purely a people manager and, and, a, and a leader of people. And I say that in a in, in a way which probably sounds unjust and unfair, and I don't mean it like that at all, but um, that's a really rewarding thing to do. It's a really rewarding thing to lead a great bunch of people. Um, and it's something that I particularly enjoy doing. But at the same time, you still want to keep your your, your tools and your, your mindset um, sharp. Because um, right. it's, yeah. it's easy to leave, you know, it's easy to lose the sharpness of it. You might not lose the fundamentals of it in the same way you might not like you're riding a bike or whatever, but does that mean you're going to be a brilliant bike rider, a confident bike rider? If you haven't ridden the bike in 10 years, I, I probably argue you wouldn't, at least not for a little while. Yeah. Um, yeah. That, and I think that th those are some of the trade-offs that you have to start making when you hit a certain position. For the folks that are tuning in, if you do have any questions, now's the time to start putting them in the comments because we're going to start going through them. I think that when I'm looking at, I'm reflecting back on my career, and I think back to a point where before I was really kind of um, the management positions were made available to me, I had the desire to get into management, which was a mm -hmm. bit paradoxical. But there were, as an analyst, I didn't have a clue of what to do as the first step into getting into management. <laughs> I don't know if, I mean, I have some clarity on how that process works. And I have quite a bit of clarity. And so I could advise myself, um, but I would ask you if you have any guidance for folks who may be in a position where they're thinking, okay, I have a certain amount of seniority. I want to get into management, but I just don't know what my next step is. I don't know. Do we have... Is there any suggestions we could offer for folks like that that would better position them for a management role? Ooh, good question. Um, I think I think the first thing before we get onto practical advice is probably just questioning your own motives. What? Why is it you want to be a manager or a leader? And you've got to have your reason why. Um, and if it's to, if it's pure, you know, if it's mainly to to or, 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 or you know just purely or mainly to 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 attract a higher salary, a higher package. I think there's a route you can do that. And I think freelancing, contracting, however you want to term that, I think there's routes there which help you achieve that in probably a better way even than, than, than staying as a permanent member of staff um, within within an organization. So I think you've got to question the reason why. And, and for everyone, that's going to be quite different. 
and I don't think there's a, you know, I'm not saying there's a right or wrong answer, far from it. Um, I think once you've made, once you know that reason and you've bought into that reason, um, I think for me, the, the, the thing that I found most helpful at least is, is networking. And, and I think, you know, as business analysts were, you know, naturally equipped with building, you know, rapport with people. I think we're naturally equipped to finding out who the best people are to build rapport with too. And right. I think it's using our, our stakeholder management skills and our ability, you know, our softer side of our skill set to, to use those in a way which um, is to showcase what business analysis is all about. And I think, um, I think that's an important thing, um, both within an organization, but also networking outside of an organization. And I think both are as equally as important. And, and the reason I say that is, of course, inside an organization, yes, getting to know people, finding out who, what's going off in the business, helping to make sure the BA practice is, is heading in a particular direction. That's all really, really important stuff. But also equally as important is to know what's, it's, no, it's, no, it's important to know what's going off outside your organization right. in the world of your profession. Yeah. And I think a lot of people problem, you know, often fall down on that. And there's so many great things out there, whether it be, you know, you know brilliant stuff that, that you and your team do, whether it be in-person events like the IBA events or the numerous different events that, are, that, that most big cities tend to have on. There's so many different routes you can connect with people. It's probably never been easier as well, I would argue, yeah, yeah than, it, than it has been in the past, particularly, you know, in the world of globally connecting with people. Um, so I think for me, that'd be my biggest, my biggest sort of piece of advice, you know, network, build those relationships and, and learn from what's going off outside where you are. Um, yeah. Otherwise, you can, you're only going to have a one dimensional view. And I think that's only going to typically probably help you repeat the same things that have been done before. Yeah. And I think the concept of networking turns a lot of people off because I think that there's a very... I think most people have a very transactional, I want to say, view of networking where, you know, you just yeah. kind of reach out to somebody on LinkedIn, send a generic message. And that's not what we mean by networking. And I think that there's I think there's a really, really effective way on how to do networking that we could possibly talk about in the future. But I think that the key one of the keys is, uh, I think you hit the nail on the head. As long as if you can do it well and you can do it right, I think that knowing the right folks can get you quite far uh, in your career. I want to run, I have another thought I want to run it by you just to vet my own thinking to see what you think about this. When I was, um, one of the things I think I realized much later in my career is that a lot of career uh, progression tends to be more about positioning almost than anything else. And here's what I mean by that. I think that management tends to always have a succession plan in mind. So they know that, you know, a manager is eventually going to leave or they're going to get promoted and there's going to be a position that's going to become available for that manager's position. And the sense that I've always gotten is, is that folks at that level are always scanning the business analysis landscape in their own company to see who might be the right fit. And a lot of this isn't really made explicit to you, but I'll share a couple of instances of asks that have been made of me that I've kind of, I've understood them kind of as tests. And so oftentimes what tends to happen is, is that you get a subtle signal from management where they'll say, hey, look, we have this thing that is quite a bit more complex maybe than you're used to. Um, it kind of goes a little bit outside of your duties as an analyst. Are you interested in taking this on, right? And some analysts may look at that as, no, you're asking me to do something that's not my job, right? I think that analysts should look at signals like that a little bit differently. You should look at it as, hey, are do you have the desire and the will and the capability to excel beyond your existing position? Because that type of um, that type of a question tends to indicate to management about who actually has a real true desire, right? To to try to expand themselves. Have you experienced any of that in, in your own career? I mean, is that would that be like an accurate assessment of management's logic around succession for for positions? 
I think I think you I think you've hit the nail on the head. I think it's certainly would it does it exist in every organization with every manager or, or leader who sits above a, a head of or director of BA of of, of 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 course not, no. But it does it happen? Yeah. And I think there's um there's a saying we sometimes say in, in, in the UK, I am I'm, I'm sure it maybe travels further as well, which is, you know, um, you know, that and I forgot the saying now. I was about to say it, I forgot the saying. But basically the sayings around um you know that that those who have come, those who have been in that seat longest, are likely to you know to be next to progress, and um, and I think you know that that can be true as well. I think someone who's been in a chair the longest amount of time, sometimes and often, will make the best leader, but also not always in, in pain on the circumstances, um, and particularly if particularly the default thought path for people is often the laziest path of thinking, isn't it? It's the path of least resistance in their thought, and they go. Oh, so and so has been here for ten years, and this person's only been here for a year, and this person's only been here for three years. Well, that person's been here ten years. Is going to know the business better. Going to have the relationships. They're going to know um, what this particular product or service means. They're going to know how to get around all of the the, the, the corporate governance to achieve the best outcomes. And like you say, it's, it's a lazy way of thinking. I, I think, I think actually, often, um, I think that's where. If I'm honest, networking probably can re- can actually open people's eyes, and, and networking can be a dirty word. You're absolutely right. What you said earlier, um, I think if you can, if we reframe that in terms of building connections, that's what we do all day as business analysts. That's nothing new. Um, networking is a dirty word because of people see it as a sales process, yeah. and um, but actually, networking, you know, is just a way of humans connecting. Um, of course, there can be a sale at the end of it, but of course, there can't. You know, arguably, when you're a single bachelor and you're going out there you're networking with other people as well in the same kind of way is, is your is your reason different well yeah of course it is but you're still building connections um but uh but yeah i've certainly seen that and i think i think for me if i was in an organization and uh, as someone who was someone who was put into a position because it seemed maybe didn't seem it seemed logical in some ways but maybe didn't seem right and you were in that team and had the, the courage and confidence. I think there's nothing wrong to question that. At the end of the day, we are analysts. That's right. That's right. Um, we have a couple of questions that have flowed in, and we can shift to taking a few of these questions. I think that the first question uh, comes to us from Kay. What advice would you give to someone getting into business analysis in their 40s? Do we have any any kind of guidance that we could offer um, somebody in that position? I I think I think to some extent. Um, well, I think firstly, let, let's get let's get the elephant in the room out of the way. I think you know you can enter business and at any age, and there is certainly no obstacle, as as I see at least, in terms of you know whether you need to be in the twenties, thirties, forties, fifties, sixties, seventies, whatever. You, you can enter business and at any age. I would actually say, in many ways, is an advantage. Of entering it, uh, you know, in, in your forties or fifties, and that advantage is actually a lot of business analysis relies on soft skills, and um, to do it well. And by that point, you know, of course, as we grow older, we we become wiser, more you know, more mature, and actually we grow a lot of those soft skills. So they're probably in a, often a more mature state than someone who maybe isn't in their forties. Um, mm. So I think I think I think that's a. Uh, you know, just to frame it, I think, you know, don't let it be a barrier. If anything, you're probably entering that in a, in a stronger position than someone else who hasn't got some of those um, softer skills. And I say, you know, those the, the, the ability to build rapport with people, that ability to, to question, have the courage to stand up when things maybe don't quite sound right uh, and everything else. Um, but, yeah, I, I, it's, I think the rest of it, the, the, for me, the pathway would be quite similar. Um, yeah. I don't know. What, what do you think, Emma? What, what, would, what would you suggest? I would say that... Somebody who's in their 40s, there's a high likelihood that you probably have done another job all throughout your career. And the, I think one of the most advantageous things about the BA career is that it gives you the opportunity to leverage your existing career. And what I mean by that is, is that if you've been an accountant, let's say, for example, your entire career, the, there, you can harvest the value of that accounting knowledge to specialize as a business analyst in accounting. And those types of professionals are 
in high demand because understanding complex subjects like that is very relevant to what is a business analyst does and it gives you the opportunity to specialize in a certain area and so i would say that for whether you're in your 40s or wherever you are i think that it gives you this the profession gives you the opportunity to harvest your previous career um i think there are probably very few if you really think about it I can't think of a single medium or large size company that can exist without business analysts. It, I, it just doesn't happen. And that's why there's such a huge demand for this profession is because basically every company, every organization in the world needs them. Um, and what you need to do is you need to really just kind of find your corner of where you fit in, right? It can be hard to really kind of, it, it's, it's, it can be a bit of a, it's a drawback and it's a benefit. It's a benefit because it has opportunities for everybody. It can be a bit of a drawback because somebody who's entering into new uh, into this profession newly can get very confused because the profession looks so fragmented, right? Because you'll see one job posting that asks for one things, and then you'll see another job posting for a business analyst that has a completely different set of skills, right? That's both a benefit and a drawback. And for newcomers, that can be a little bit confusing as to why that happens. But you have to see that as, as a strength because you what you have to do to find your place is to find the right set of job postings that fit your existing knowledge base, right? So again, if I'm an accountant, let's say I've been working in accounts payable for all my life and just paying companies for the invoices they send me. Well. You might not know, but that accounts payable is a very important piece of domain knowledge for analysts who help to implement and maintain accounts payable systems, right? That kind of knowledge oftentimes is is, is very um, needed. If you're new to the profession, there's a place for you. You just have to kind of wade through some of the complexity to find your place, right? Um, so hopefully great that's advice. helpful. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, no, uh, great advice. I would say that uh, we are getting close and we do have quite a few questions that have come in. Uh, we're going to try to get through them a little bit more quickly uh, if we can here. We have a question that's come in that asks, will AI have an adverse impact on business and analyst jobs or would it be helping BAs do their jobs more effectively? Thoughts? Oof. Well, it feels like a good time to announce our a bit of news, I guess, as well, yeah. isn't it? Um, great segue for sure. It's a great segue. So, well, you, you may have seen it on you may have seen it on LinkedIn or some of the other social media channels, but um, we uh, it's it's an important question you ask, and it's a question which I think has been um, causing some headaches for us as a consultancy, as a, as a specialist business analysis consultancy, and and a lot of interest. And I think similarly um, for Imal and the team at BA Block. So we've recently decided. Um, to launch a, a, a collaboration um, uh, and, and we're doing a massive research looking into the different use cases of how it, that certain tools like ChatGPT and other can be used to help business analysis uh, and then at some point we'll be hoping to lead, move into the world of ethics as well and what that means uh, when we're looking at these things both as an analyst in the profession but also as an analyst helping organization implement AI technologies to support um particular you know biz business processes or, or, or journeys for, for their customers um so yeah i think will it adversely impact i i think i, I think that's such a big question it, it's it's tough to, to really answer i think for me I, I would say the adverse impact no as i see it i think there's so many things that ai tools cannot do and will very likely never be able to do as effectively but could it help our would it is there potential to help us do our jobs more effectively hell yeah absolutely there is um Amal, yeah. what do you say i mean look i think you and i have both been dedicating a significant amount of resources to answer the question of how uh, it can be so the hell yeah i i second that answer um the how i think is part is what is going to require research Right. And so we've done quite a bit of research already to get to a position where we found a few use cases that are very important. And we won't dive into it uh, just in the interest of time. But if you go to bablocks.com slash AI, 
you can get a very clear idea of where we think business analysis is going and what kind of use cases we think are available for business analysts to be able to leverage AI in the way that it needs to be. Um, so a lot more coming on this in the future, but I think that it's important. What I would suggest you don't do is to stick your head in the sand, pretend like it doesn't exist, because I think that's probably the biggest mistake that you can make. And so um, we're going to get down to the real answer to that question uh, through our research and development. We'll come back to you and uh, and answer this question uh, in more detail. Um, what tools, we'll take a few more questions here. We got quite a few questions streaming in now. Um, what tools would it be beneficial to learn to stay relevant in uh, the BA world? I would say that uh, the top two tools that we're watching right now, ChatGPT has been the most powerful tool. There is daily a constant new stream of tools that are coming out and we're doing our best to stay up uh, to date with the tools. So far, I personally have not yet seen a tool that can match um, ChatGPT's ability to help business analysts. The uh, We both have our sites set on Microsoft's Copilot as the second tool. And as soon as it gets released, um, you can bet that we're going to hop on live sessions like this and actually show you use cases of how to use this to do certain co uh, common business analysis tasks. Um, there is a question, I think, um, a very big question, but I think a really important one that I'd like to address if you have a few more minutes, Jamie. I know that we're we're approaching time. Um, Sinead asks, any guidance on how to influence higher management uh, on the importance of business analysis? We have a relatively small team in comparison to size and number of businesses and size of projects, but struggle to get approval for expanding the team capability? Yeah, this uh, this is a really common question, actually. And I think I say common in terms of it. it's something that's brought up a lot uh, in lots of organizations. And I think regardless of size or scale, actually, in terms of how can you influence higher management on the importance of, of, of what we do? And I think there's, there's a few things there that, that we recommend and actually working with a number of clients ourselves, actually, on, on this exact question, trying to solve this exact problem. Um, and I think the most important thing that I would recommend to anybody is have a really clearly defined BA service. So often we talk as analysts as individuals, often we talk about techniques because often we learn about techniques before we learn about anything else. And actually those techniques only mean something to someone who understands those techniques. And also people are interested in, you know, maybe it's oh, John can do a brilliant job, but, you know, um, Jamie can't. Um, People want to see about it from a service lens. And I think um, it's something that's been really starting to take traction in the last few years, uh, last couple of years in particular. I think there's still a long way to go. I think many organizations haven't adopted that, that service mindset to looking at the BA profession in that, in that sense. Mm -hmm. um, but my main advice to any organization would be to set your stall out, build up a BA service definition um, that really articulates from a from an from someone who's consuming that service, what it is you do and, and the value it brings. Um, and often it also can be helpful to articulate what would happen if you weren't there? Um, what would stop if you were not there? What would the risk be of you not being there? So they, they'd be my top bits of advice. And I think you're uniquely positioned to be able to answer this question given the fact that you've, I mean, you've been in the trenches doing the work, you've managed the employees, and you're in, you know, you're designing services essentially as as a uh, as a consulting house um, to do that. And I think that that is um, that's great advice. Is that the thing that you said that really kind of um, stuck with me is is that you can't talk about techniques because techniques. I mean, when I take my car into my mechanic, I don't care what tools he's using. Quite frankly, I, I have, you know. Explain to me how your service is going to benefit me, please, and <laughs> show me what I'm getting for my money, for lack of a better way of saying it, and um, and you have my business, essentially. And so um, I think that that's an excellent place to leave it off. We do have a couple of questions, unfortunately, that we were not able to get to, but I will spend a little bit of time trying to answer them in the, um, in the post session. Folks, um, for those folks who um, didn't um, 
join us early enough, I'm going to encourage you to uh, check out herd.consulting to kind of get a clear understanding of what um, you might sell, yourself might be as a senior business analyst. You may be in a position where consultancy is your next stage. You may be in a position where you think to yourself, I'm really interested in working for a company like this. You might eventually become a manager who says to themselves, I need a team like this to help me augment my own team. There, um, You'll benefit a lot just from understanding really what uh, 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 an organization like this can do for you. I want to thank you all for taking the time to join us. As always, you can find all of the links at bablocks.com slash live. Um, feel free to connect with Jamie uh, through his LinkedIn profile there and make sure you visit the website. Jamie, I want to thank you so much for taking this busy time out of your schedule. Thank you for inviting me. It's been great, great fun. Hopefully I can be invited back again in the future. I'm definitely looking forward to another conversation because I do have a lot of follow-up questions. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Jamie. We'll see you on the next one. Take care, folks.